basel uh, who will uh, speak on uh, basic tuning of mechanical precipitation in front of your feet. Thank you. Thank you. So welcome back. Um, so today I will talk about uh, free standing graphene membranes. And in our measurements, we are doing non-contact AFM, so it's a non-contact dissipation or non-contact friction. And we are interested in what we call quantum graphene. So basically, we are looking at uh, objects in graphene that behave as quantum dots, so it can be defect or it can be surface deformation. And uh, we are using uh, a scanning probe. And what is interesting is that with uh, um, scanning tunneling microscopy or STM, it has been shown that uh, surface deformation, like here a puddle, can behave as quantum dots. So we can charge and discharge this uh, surface deformation. So basically the measurements, uh, it's uh, DIDV. So here you have the density of state. Here you have the energy. And every peak you see in the spectroscopy, it's a charging event that occur in this quantum dot. And these behaviors, they can explain with this uh, two capacitance model. In atomic force microscope, it's also possible to charge and discharge quantum dots. So here you have a semiconductor quantum dot, a tunnel barrier, and an electron gas. And the oscillation of the cantilever over on top of the quantum dot is putting in and out the electrons in the quantum dot. And the system can also be uh, described with this simple capacitance model. So in the AFM spectroscopy, the charging and discharging event looks like this. So here you have the force, here you have the dissipation, and here you have the bias voltage. And what you see is that at certain bias voltage, you have a drop in the frequency shift that is followed with a peak in dissipation. And this is characteristic to electron charging in quantum dot with AFM. And when you do a uh, real space imaging, so X and Y, you see that those peaks, they look like Coulomb rings. So this brings me to my outlook. So I will make a small introduction about our system and the sample. And then I will explain you our measurements. So first, the typical dissipation experiments, and then how they behave in the magnetic field. And then I will do a small conclusion. So our system is an atomic force microscope, but uh, our geometry is different, so we call it pendulum, because the cantilever is uh, perpendicular to the sample surface, and it's oscillating like a small pendulum over the sample surface. And this geometry is to avoid the snapping of the tip onto the sample surface, and this enables us to use very, uh, to use cantilever with uh, uh, low stiffness, so very small uh, spring constant. So basically, it's a contact uh, cantilever that we use to do non-contact uh, uh, measurements. And we have high quality factor. And these two parameters, they are the main parameters we can change to increase our sensibility. And if we compare it to different techniques, you can see that here it's the dissipation. And here it's the spatial resolution. In terms of spatial resolution, we are OK. And in terms of dissipated power, we can be very sensitive. So our system looks like this, so it's a beam deflection AFM. We operate in UHV, and the measurements that we show you today are made at low temperature. And basically what we call dissipation or friction is uh, the evolution of the oscillation of our cantilever depending the tip sample distance. So we set our cantilever to a fixed amplitude, so in this case it was two nanometer. So we make it oscillate to two nanometer, and when we approach it to the sample surface, the interaction between the tip and the sample surface are dumping the cantilever, uh, yes. And then we use an electronic circuit, or the phase lock loop, uh, to keep this oscillation constant. So what he's doing is that it's applying an excitation to the cantilever to keep this oscillation constant. And then, uh, due to that, we can get the frequency shift and the dissipation with this uh, expression. And in real life, it looks like that. So here you have the cantilever, and here you have the sample. So our sample is a copper substrate patterned with holes of 6.5 microns of diameter, where a film of graphene, a monolayer graphene, was deposited on top of it in order to have a free standing, circular freestanding graphene sheet, just like this. So before to do the experiment, we wanted to characterize our sample, so we did STM imaging 
uh, on the graphene that is supported on the copper substrate and on the freestanding graphene. So this is uh, the typical image we got on the supported graphene. So you see that we are able to reconstruct the honeycomb lattice of the graphene, just like this. And on the, on the freestanding graphene, we can guess a structure underneath on the graphene, but the main structure that we saw is uh, some surface deformation, and the more prominent ones are these uh, wrinkles, so nanoribbon-like uh, structure with a width of two nanometer, uh, yes, of two nanometer. And again, we can describe our system with these two capacitance model. So this is the typical dissipation spectrum that we got. So the tip was um, 200 nanometer away from uh, the freestanding graphene, and then we apply a bias voltage and we looked at the frequency shift and the dissipation. So here you can see that on the frequency shift at certain biases we have a drop in the frequency shift that are followed with peaks in the dissipation. And this is what I showed you before, that it's characteristic to charging and discharging events on quantum dots using AFM. When we take back this uh, simple model, we can wonder what is the effect of every capacitance. So this is what I will try to discuss today. So first we in investigate the tip capacitance. So it's easy to investigate because we just need to change the tip sample distance and look what is happening. And this is what you see here in this map. So here you have the tip sample distance. Here you are far away from the sample and here you are at the surface. We applied a bias voltage, and the contrast that you see is the dissipation. So the black uh, color is for low dissipation, and the yellow color is for high dissipation. And the curve, the white line here, it's the curve I showed you before. So what we see is that when we change the um, tip capacitance, we are shifting the peaks to lower biases, and this shift is called the lever arm. So basically with that, we uh, understand that the tip sample distance or the tip capacitance is shifting the peaks into lower, lower voltages when we get closer to the sample surface. So the second question is, what is the effect then of the substrate capacitance? So to investigate it, we need to consider two capacitance one capacitance for the geometry and the environment, and one capacitance that is the quantum capacitance that can lead to quantization if the system enables it. So this quantum capacitance is described with this formula. So here you have a prefactor, here you have the quantization, and here you have the heavy side uh, function for symmetrization. And what you see is that this quantum capacitance is directly proportional to the density of states. So uh, we try to model this capacitance so with a different uh, size. So here in the quantization, you see you have the W, so the size of your graphene that you're considering. And here we plot it for two sizes. The blue size is for 100 nanometer graphene, so like a, a big uh, graphene flake. And you see that you have the normal V shape of graphene without any uh, peaks. And when we lower this size, so for the orange curve, it's for a five nanometer ribbon graphene. And you see that we start to see peaks, and those peaks, they are Van Hoof singularities. So this is a strong hint to tell us that the peaks that we are seeing in the dissipation, they are due to these Van Hoof singularities. So in order to verify this, we try to uh, model our frequency shifts uh, our frequency shift data to see if we are able to fit these peaks and this position with uh, just this simple assumption. And then we then decided to fit the frequency shift because it's easier to fit than the dissipation. The formula is a bit easier. So here we have again a prefactor. And then there is two uh, parts. The first part is to describe the charge in the graphene and its image charge in the cantilever. The second part is uh, the interaction between the charge in the, um, in the graphene flake and uh, the polarized charge in the tip. And the third the part is uh, to describe the parabolic background and it's also um, describing the interaction between the polarized charge in the tip and the back gate electrode. 
So here you have again this um, frequency shift. Here you have the bias and uh, the blue curve is the dissipation. The black curve is the data that we recorded and the red curve is the, the fitting using this formula. And for the quantum capacitance, we use a width uh, equal to nanometer like we found on the STM. And what you can see is that we are able, just with this simple assumption, to fit the position and the drops in the frequency shift. So this is a strong hit to say that the peaks we are seeing in the dissipation, they are really due to these uh, uh, Van Hoof singularities. And uh, another remark is that uh, you see that the drops in the frequency shift, they are very small, but the peaks in dissipation are very big. So basically what that means is that we are more sensitive to uh, with the dissipation channels to these Van Hoof singularities than in the frequency shift. So uh, now that we know how they behave at zero magnetic field, we wondered how they behave in the magnetic field. So we uh, did the magnetic field measurements by applying a magnetic field from minus two Tesla to two Tesla with a step of 0.12 Tesla. And we apply again the um, the bias voltage, and here the contrast is again the dissipation. So dark blue is low dissipation, and yellow is high dissipation. And the first thing that we observe is that uh, the peaks, they are shifting to lower energies. And this shift is linear. So to try to understand this, we uh, uh, use the semi-classical Borsum effect phase accumulation model. So basically when you are at a zero magnetic field, the, the system is behaving like a normal quantum well, so you can describe it with this formula, so the wave vector is proportional to two pi n, and when you start to apply a magnetic field, you start to accumulate, accumulate uh, the electron in, uh, due to this uh, magnetic phase accumulation, and then you have this phase here that is added to the formula that is called the payer phase. And for the linear shift, we believe that it's due to the linear energy dis uh, dispersion of graphene. So when you put this into uh, the formula, we found that um, Vs, so the sample bias, is linearly proportional to the magnetic field, and this is in direct uh, uh, agreement, a good agreement with the linear dispersion of graphene. So what we did is that we added this pair face in the model I showed you before to see if we are able to fit again the position and the drops of the peak. So this is, a, again, the zero magnetic field, so zero uh, degree for the pair phase. So we were able, I already showed you that we were able to fit the position and the drop on the frequency shift. And now when we apply a magnetic field, just by uh, uh, increasing this pair phase, you see that we are able to fit the position of um, the drops in the frequency shift, just like this. So this looks like to be also in great agreement with what we, we believe, so that we are accumulating the charge with this pair phase and then this shifting to lower energy, the, the peaks. So the last part of the talk is uh, to see what uh, how the peaks looks like in the real space. So we uh, look at the bias voltage where we have this dissipation peak and we do constant height imaging on this uh, specific bias on the sample. And this is what we got. So you see that they look like uh, the Coulomb rings, but they are not circular like we can expect to Coulomb rings. They are elongated and if uh, you put uh, the STM image on top of it, you see that this uh, elongation is in the same direction as the wrinkle we observe in the STM images. So what we think is that mm, we, are, um, we are charging these uh, wrinkles in, and uh, the electrons are uh, confined along these wrinkles. And when we apply a magnetic field, you can see that uh, they have the same behavior as in the map I showed you, so they, have, they disappear by increasing the magnetic field. So to try to understand better this uh, linear shift, we ask uh, our colleague from CISA, so to Ali, to do some tight binding uh, calculation to try to understand better this linear uh, motion. And uh, this is uh, his uh, simulation, so you have uh, 
the, the black feature, it's uh, like a different wrinkles, and he did a calculation with different shape, and what he told us, and what looks like uh, going on, is that we have a small object that confines the electrons, but this linear shift is due to a bigger structure in the membrane, so it's completely independent to the wrinkles. And he's uh, able, so here you have magnetic field, here you have energy, and this is a theoretical uh, uh, bounds and the uh, and the uh, right red dot sorry they are our measurements and you can see that uh, with a bigger structure than just these two nanometer wrinkles he's able to uh, fit uh, quite well the position of the motion of the peaks so that means that we have bigger structure that needs to be taken in consideration so with that I want to conclude so I showed you the pendulum atomic force microscopy measurements of a freestanding graphene. So we saw formation of uh, wrinkles in the membranes. And when we do dissipation measurement, we see that we have two peaks that are due to quantum capacitance. And we also saw that the dissipation signal is more sensitive to the Van Hoof singularities as compared to the frequency shift. And uh, we are assuming that we are confining electrons into this surface deformation. And in real space, they look like uh, Coulomb rings uh, along this specific direction. And the magnetic field, we are inducing a pair of phase that is shifting the uh, peaks to lower energy. This, peaks, uh, this shift is linear due to the linear energy dissipation of graphene and the tight binding calculations show us that we have uh, a distribution of length scale that have different uh, uh, properties. Uh, behavior on our dissipation peak. So basically we have small structure that behave like quantum dots and bigger structure that are shifting the, um, the peaks on the magnetic field. And then what we can say is that the wrinkle don't really alter the, this linear behavior. So with that, I want to uh, thank uh, our collaborator from CISA and uh, uh, Ernst Mayer for taking me as a PhD student and all the other members of the group and the founding, so the ERC and the SNI, and you for your attention. Thank you very much. Yeah, um, thank you for your very nice talk. Uh, I was wondering, when you showed this uh, magnetic field dependence with positive and negative field, uh, perhaps slide 11 or something. Yeah, that one, yeah. Uh, okay. Um, Oh, well, the, the, the one, uh, with po yeah, this one. Um, I was wondering, positive and negative field, are they different uh, because of uh, some reason, or, or is that, uh, say, ex experimental error? We have, you have a different strength of the signal in the positive and negative reason. Yeah, yeah. you mean this uh, bigger uh, dissipation on negative side? Exactly. Uh, uh, this... Uh, I don't really know where this asymmetry is coming from, but we think it can be due to uh, different uh, 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 symmetry because we have wrinkles, so we have uh, distortion at some part of the wrinkles uh, in the system, and then this can behave differently with the dissipation field. Yes. But we didn't really investigate. I actually had the same question, so okay. <laughs> over the top. Could it be that the film itself is not symmetric? That it mean it could have a polarization, for example, and the negative and positive voltage would do something different. Maybe we have uh, defected, I think, uh, because it's a big uh, layer, so we have... But you have the layer on a surface, right? It, it could no, be this one is uh, freestanding. Freestanding. Mm -hmm.
Yeah, thanks for the, for the talk. I was wondering, those big uh, samples, how do you how do you actually actually produce them? Oh, we bought them. They are coming from a company. So they put it on the on the hall for you. 